It is my great pleasure, a great joy for me to introduce to you Tommy Rush and Richard Jolly. We are very, very lucky to have them here, and they're very lucky to have each other because they're married, you know. <laughs> this is a great couple, really. So I'm going to start first with a woman, okay, Richard? Absolutely. Women, go first. Tommy. Tommy Rush obtained her BFA, and I'm going to be very, there's a lot to tell you about both of them, but we only have one hour here. And so I don't want to use the time. I want them to use the time. So I'm going to tell you just a few things, and then if you have questions, ask them, okay? Uh, she got her BFA at the University of Tennessee, and then she studied craft at the Aramont School of Craft. Her work is included in many private and museum collections, the Renwick Gallery, among others. What Tommy does with glass is quite incredible. She manipulates thick, heavy glass to create the most delicate, gentle forms. You're going to show us some, right? Mm. She eliminates all harsh lines and angles in favor of smooth, sensual curves. Just wait till you see it. Her work has a gorgeous, soft, fluid elegance. She loves flowers, but she has no time to garden. She's too busy creating. But she shows flowers in her work. And her colors are vibrant. And she has stated that she's not afraid to mix colors well till you see. And they are unbelievable combinations and very unique. Her pieces actually are quite magical. They seem to be illuminated from within. I have no idea how you do that. It has been said that her work is reminiscent of the Art Nouveau period. But let me tell you something. It's reminiscent of nothing, just tummy rush. And now we're going to Richard Jolly. There is so much to tell you about Richard that I would be using all of my allotted time and all of their allotted time, and it's not fair. So I just want to present to you a very brief glimpse of the man who's going to be in front of you in a few minutes. He's got his BFA at George Peabody College in Nashville. That is not part of Vanderbilt University. He has had over 65 museums and gallery exhibits in the United States, in Europe, and in Japan in Carnegie and Corning and Los Angeles County Museum of Modern Art and the Renwick, of course, among others. He had a major retrospective in 2010 and 2002 at uh, the Knoxville Museum of Art that then traveled to 14 different museums of the, uh, over five years. In 2007, Richard was the youngest visual artist to ever receive the Tennessee's Governor's Distinguished Artist Award. He probably was about 17 years old. And now, of course, there is the famous, the very famous cycle of life within the power of dreams and the wonder of infinity. That's the title of his work. And it's now being displayed at the Knoxville Museum of Art. And everyone, but everyone in the art world is talking and writing about it. And I'm just going to tell you very, very briefly what people are saying about it. It is an aesthetically stunning master masterwork. In other words, it's gorgeous. But it's also an engineering marvel. It, it reveals Richard's exceptional artistic rigor and vision. That he has transformed a mere building, a plain building, into an art-filled one. His work is moving. It is melodramatic. It's exotic. It's sensual. It's mystical. He explores where we're coming from and where we're going. So in effect, the way I look at it, Richard's is not just another work of art. It's a story. It's a narrative. It's a le lesson in life. Enough said. Listen to the artists themselves. Please help me welcome first, Tommy Rush. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you all for coming today, and thank the J James Renwick Alliance for having us. Thank you all for braving the traffic conditions. I like to sort of give people an idea of who we are and what, I, what sort of where you come from and how you got where you are now. I'm married to Richard, and this is a, that's an amazing pho pho photograph by Greg Gorman. Richard's a risk taker, likes to do things that I would never do, like this, climb on a glacier in New Zealand. 
I grew up in Mobile, Alabama. It's about as far south as you can go without getting in the Gulf of Mexico. This was the neighborhood I grew up in. That was not my house, but this is what my parents, I'm sure, thought I would look like. I'm a little disappointing to them, but um, <laughs> if there's anyone in the audience from New Orleans, I hate to tell you, but Mobile did bring Mardi Gras back. And that's a big part of our life down there. So, <laughs> yes, in a former life. Um, so while Richard's family were splitting atoms, my family was doing things like this. I think you're, that's, I don't have a lot of family left. That's about it. One of my wonderful nieces. This is where I live now in Knoxville. Friends are really important to us, and they... Um, have been a big part of our life and help us in many ways. I have also been very, very involved in Richard's five-year odyssey. These were two of the first people that really ever believed in us, Ross and Gladie Ferris, and we are forever grateful to them. Love to travel. Food's really important. Here we are in Scotland with Dan Klein. I love practical jokes, so I made all my friends act like they were passed out on the table at a restaurant and had the waiter take our picture. We've had some wonderful support through the years, and see, you see a lot of food and cooking, and that is important to me, as is travel. I was on the board at Penland School, I was also on the Glass Art Society board and um, the American Craft Council board. Here we are in the garden of the Guggenheim Museum at a dinner party after an opening Richard had in Venice, so I'm lucky to get to go along with him. I love gardening, and I always think my gardens are going to look like this. <laughs> but it looks like that. One of the great things about traveling with Richard is you never know what's going to happen. Here he is doing some works on paper with sepia de Nero pasta. <laughs> and there's one of the pieces in the gallery in Venice that was made with the pasta. I think travel really broadens your intellect and your horizons. I mean, look at this. We can't make anything that gorgeous. Wonderful piece of Anish Kapoor with us in it. I love the Italians because where else would you have Piazza Navona and these balloons? I mean, look at this car. Yeah, I love things like this. This is in the Orkney Island in Scotland, you know? I mean, I just love things like this. I always have to show Cosimo de' Medici's statue of his favorite person at the Pitti Palace. You know, that's when you got real money. One of the other things that's important to us is giving back to our community, and I would encourage everyone to do that. Uh, we have worked with an after-school program for any inner-city kids for 17 years, and it is incredibly rewarding. They look like they're having a pretty good time. Here's one of the littlest guys we ever worked with. And recently we started working with a magnet school of inner city kids from the third grade and they do drawings and we make whatever they draw. And then this is what I do. Um, I did grow up in the South, as I said, and there is a big decorative art tradition there, and I was certainly influenced by that. Both of my grandmothers were avid gardeners, and I was lucky enough to get to experience that with them. I'm going fast because we only have an hour. Trust me, those of you that know me know that I could <coughs> ramble on for hours. So all my work is made on the blowpipe, and it, this is all bit work. Um, I use the royal wheat because Richard really does it, but we melt all of our own colors and make all of our own glass. So that's why our color palette is so, so distinctive. But it's all done free form on the blowpipe. So you see I use a lot of organic shapes. And um, we had our first exhibition together in Mobile a couple of years ago, and it was, um, we'd never done that before. 
These are my happy pills. When the recession happened in 2008, I got so tired of everyone whining, I decided the whole country needed to take a bunch of happy pills. Um, and there, this is a big installation of them at the museum, and I love it because the close-up are all these little handprints from children poking their little hands in the rice. These are some installation shots from the museum, and Richard and I had never had an exhibition together, so it, it was interesting to see how our work played off of each other. I took a lot of art history classes, so I'm always trying to think of some way to fit that in there, so this is a Romanesque face. Some of my latest work has been daffodils. All the surfaces are sandblasted and acid etched, and that's what gives it that real satiny kind of look to it. And I can't tell you why it's luminous or I'd have to kill all of you when you left the auditorium. You know, I use very classical shapes when I, when I want the vessel to really look like a vessel. And I think studying art history is really important for artists. I think you, you need to know your history just like you need to know the history of where you're from. This was a manta bowl, and I was inspired to do that after watching manta rays when we were down in the Caribbean one time snorkeling. So I'd steal most of my ideas from nature. Little daffodil vase. I really don't think of these as, you know, vases. I sort of think of them as a canvas to, to put three-dimensional flowers on. I did a commission for Scripps Network, HGTV is based in Knoxville, and they asked me to do a commission, and they're sort of conservative, and I was really surprised they picked this because this was the most out-of-the-box design that I did. It's really a scrim of glass that's sandblasted and acid etched, and the leaves are metal that are on the back side of it, and then that's a three-dimensional metal branch that's coming off of the plane. And really the only part that's glass that I made were the green leaves. So um, it looks great in their executive offices. And after I did it, and you can see it's site specific, the person that commissioned me to do it decided not enough people got to see it. And he said, can we move it? And I said, Mark, it's called site specific for a reason. <laughs> so no. <laughs> I love the inner, and this really was inspired from the sun. We have a Japanese maple tree right outside our kitchen window, and the sun comes in, and it had this incredible shadow on the wall, and that's what made me want to do that. You don't get anything done when you work on this scale or the scale that Richard works on without some help, and we are lucky to have helpers. James in the yellow and Raul next to me have been with us, James for eight years and Raul for 10 years. Richard's been with me longer than that. Nate has gone on and started his own studio in the Atlanta area. But you feel really lucky when you can work with good people. Richard's a big help. He's not neat, but he's a big help. So really, I do benefit a lot from Richard's incredible knowledge of color chemistry. Um, I think you can spot one of our pieces immediately because of our color palette. And the squirrels can't eat those daffodils. I'm an affirmed squirrel disliker. So they do have a real flowy kind of organic feel, and, they, and Giselle is very correct. I, I obviously don't like hard edges. 
So all you need to be a glass artist and have a studio is a big old bag of money, because it takes that to run it. Richard unfortunately showed me our year-end gas bill last year, and I almost fainted. We're coming to the close of my lecture. Some of the best public art mo in Mobile is in the cemeteries, the old cemeteries, and my family has a plot, though there's no room for me, um, <laughs> at Magnolia Cemetery in Mobile, and as a child, I would go all around the cemetery all the time, and this was one of my favorite statues. And so we are now at the end of my lecture, and I want to thank you all. Richard, here's Richard Jolly. <laughs> Am I on? Okay. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming today. Um, in organizing the uh, Distinguished Artist Lecture for the Smithsonian uh, Art, <clears throat> American Art Museum, my thoughts drifted to the concept of the American dream. Is it, symbolic, is it the symbolic freedom of the American West? Or is it the freedom created by science in the mid-century? Is it the freedom to live in peace or just a good pair of shoes? Is it the freedom of privacy or companionship? Or is it the freedom to be an artist? I have way too many slides, so I'll sort of click through some without narratives. Uh, some of them are sequencing. Uh, being raised in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, I feel like I have a natural affinity for new materials, possibly as one of the reasons for my comfort with glass as a non-traditional material for making sculpture, or was it the affinity for a secret tradition? I chose to find my voice in, with figurative sculpture, which would reference the human condition. As of this piece, Early experts said my work was, was cast because the form was in a matte surface. And at this point, I'd like to talk about art in the context of it really doesn't matter how it's made, it's the success of the conceptual articulation. The blue line drawings were the, my first mature body of work. It took me about 10 years to uh, work in the studio to get to this point. And most of them are figure studies. I include these, these are small wall reliefs. They relate to uh, the narrative quality in some of my work. Uh, I think when you're young, you try to do these stringent uh, academic things to be you know, contextualized as sculpture. Uh, this series started as uh, a work of these strong, uh, dignified figures that were to emulate a high polished black marble. As I moved through the series, I used them as maquettes for bronzes. And then it also branched off into the pieces which were much more uh, technically uh, virtuosity as far as uh, constructed with the uh, glass material. And about this time, I started taking my works on paper uh, much more seriously. I think this is sort of the dilemma we all uh, face um, of trying to make something that is real and sometimes we're not quite successful. I don't know, I love this genuine fake Roch uh, image, so it's uh, real, but it's fake. Um, as you can see, I sort of work through bodies of work. I, I work on a multiplicity of things. Um, these were some to totemic forms. These were the early ones that I started in the um, mid-90s. And uh, you know, most of them have a narrative to them, uh, tour de femme, that uh, women are the backbone of society. Uh, work and relaxation, seasonal objects. Um, I think with my work, I liked, um, I enjoy being a, a material artist in the sense that there's a true uh, acquisition of knowledge that you gain by working with materials. And it's, it's very uplifting. And so I think sometimes uh, sculptural forms uh, inform uh, two-dimensional forms and other times it's vice versa. The piece on the, your left, uh, it's a scorched uh, wood with Prismacolor work. Uh, these are my earlier uh, steel and uh, uh, 
armatured pieces. And uh, we had returned from Australia. I, a lot of the work sort of had this sense of constellation and night skies, uh, the sense of solitude. Um, this is Karen. It's a uh, installation that I had at the Arthur Roger Gallery. I, I think when I started the installation, uh, I thought of Karen's as being very much more like a trail marking path in, um, you know, like in hiking or you know national parks or something like that. And later did I realize, having gone to Scotland, that it's really much more like the uh, the care a true Karen of the Scottish tradition is, is much more like the uh, stones left on the grave sites of the Jewish faith, you know, very much marking those that are no longer with us. In whatever year Giselle said I had the retrospective. Uh, this is a shot in the Tennessee State Museum. Here's some large varnished uh, works as well as the uh, glass forms. Tabula Rasa, uh, with a fresh start, I think, with a lot of my work. I work for a certain amount of time and, and, and start on something new, sort of the form of the egg. This was a direct drawing uh, technique that I, I mean, a direct hot carving technique that I uh, developed to achieve, and then works on paper using sort of the uh, techniques that uh, so many of the European cathedrals are uh, decorated with, only in much more of a contemporary vein. These are works on paper, so this is like 42 inches by 8 feet. This is a sculptural format of uh, levitation with that, and then um, specific glass forms. Uh, I think why I love Italy is only in Italy do they believe the artist should go first instead of the uh, well-known doctors. And, and uh, so it, it's interesting. We have had the opportunity to, to work in Venice. And I was coming back one day to work actually on the uh, drawings Tommy showed. And in the Vaporetto, the public Vaporetto, people were like accordions and just moved back and forth and did not crush your paper. If you were on the New York subway, it would have been crushed like the first two seconds that you were in. So it is amazing sort of the uh, respect that uh, different fields are given in different countries. I had the opportunity to design a stage set for the Magic Flute uh, with the Knoxville Opera Company. I believe the Indianapolis Opera Company currently owns the stage sets. But uh, for myself, it was uh, very affirming from working on sort of standard drawings and then having them enlarged to complete stage sets. Uh, I'm fairly much of a contrarian individualist, so some of the consensus building that went on to have certain sets was a little bit uh, rancorous to me, but uh, somehow we ended up finishing the project in, in, in good faith with interesting images. The uh, director of the opera company wanted me to do these large glass forms. Um, and as you well know, the opera companies do not have that large of a budget. But I think we came up with a very interesting solution to use plexiglass. And a, a, a company had a printer. They normally do uh, the really nice UV um, screening that most um, uh, buildings have today. And uh, from these drawings, we developed these large uh, scale uh, plexiglass figures, which are between 8 and 12 feet tall. And then also the top uh, crowning figures, uh, approximately 40 feet in uh, distance. Some of the pieces were very tradi traditional in the uh, screen painting uh, format. And then others were, again, this uh, computer generated enlargements. This was the uh, smaller format uh, image that I ended up taking away from the piece. Uh, we do try to get involved in our community. Um, I chose not to be a teacher, uh, but at the same time, you know, this is sort of something that we do to helpfully, hopefully broaden people's worlds. We're not trying to turn uh, these children into artists. We're trying to, you know, teach them to, you know, assimilate knowledge, be team, team players, talk with them about physics, and, uh, you know, things like centrifugal force, uh, probably one of the most marked, and then the bigger kids. Oh, there's a celebrity here in the audience. <laughs> well, I actually met Michael for the first time when we were teaching over in Turkey. It was a fun experience. 
in our third graders, which we do a, a draw and make, something that the Corning Museum developed. Um, but it's a great opp opportunity to have arts be a uh, learning tool in, in your uh, community. I always like to juxtapose sort of the classical and the contemporary translating substance. Uh, this is a piece that uh, is probably one of the cores that will be used when I start to work on the uh, Knoxville Museum project. Uh, it's the steel armature piece. It uh, ended up in World Trade Number 7. It looks fabulous in the lobby. These are the uh, patrons for the Knoxville Museum. But again, at this point, I started doing these construction of uh, uh, glass forms with uh, steel armatures and a sense of wondering. View from here. This is approximately uh, uh, six and a half, uh, seven feet in scale. I had the show of a gallery. The, the assistant uh, did not have the proper size to the door. We had to disassemble it on uh, 57th Street in New York and bring it into the gallery. It's, uh, I think in the future, I probably will uh, go up with my own ruler and measure things. But uh, we got it in, luckily, with uh, half inch to spare Thursday. I think as an artist, you always respect tradition, and then you also try to have somewhat of your own personality. I've always loved the uh, vignettes of still lifes uh, traditionally. This is the uh, Mobile show that Tommy had a few other shots of. The nice thing about the arts is it makes the world a very small place, and you have the opportunity to spend time with people you respect, uh, realize that there's a different culture and a, uh, stylistically a different way of life. So we've had the opportunity to work in uh, Murano a, a couple times uh, since 11. I'm always uh, amazed and I'm so um, impressed with the work ethic of the general, quote, factory worker. They are so proud of their tradition and their competency. It's truly a, a joy to have an opportunity to work, to work with them. And though I'm uh, illiterate in the context of uh, language, so I do not really talk to them, you know, we just sort of talk in gestures of material, and they've worked <coughs> so long, once they see you working on the process, they realize what you're doing and just completely niche in. This is uh, Davide Salvadori, one of the young lions in uh, Murano. Oh, when I went to Venice, I wanted to make some things that were sort of iconically jolly. I know that's sort of an odd statement. Uh, and something that was Venetian, and I personally do not enjoy doing a lot of the filigree that uh, a, lot of a lot of people do so well. Uh, so I chose to do this leafing, which relates to a lot of the early century uh, uh, chandeliers. So the luminosity of, of metal surfacing on the contemporary forms. This is sort of some of my smaller scale current work. In about uh, eight years ago, a new director came to the Knoxville Museum and um, wanted to uh, you know, get involved and uh, change the sense of what was going there and, and move it to the future. This is the Knoxville Museum. It's a, uh, I think it's about uh, 5,600 square foot Edward Larrabee Barnes Mill, uh, Museum. For those of you that don't know about minimal architects, he did, uh, he probably is better known for the Walker and the Dallas Museum, but this is one of his uh, freestanding uh, buildings. It's actually the, one of the perfect cubes. I think in Katona, New York, there's a quarter scale or a third scale of the same building. But it's a fabulous place to uh, show art. Um, so I was charged with changing this event space or the Great Hall into an art space. As you can see, um, with these large scale paintings, which are probably 10 by 8, how small they look in this space. Um, the 
plus side of this building is that it has a fabulous light. Uh, the quality of light is, is great. The downside of it, if you're doing a narrative, it has this stairwell. So I start, started getting involved in the project. We went to Italy and France trying to look at the, um, you know, some of the frescoes and heroic paintings in France. And it was not to appropriate imagery. It truly was to feel comfortable in the scale that I would be working in. This is uh, a beautiful chapel uh, of a, a Bernini that's the perfect oval. Around 2000, I was doing these works on paper. I think as an artist, uh, you never know what will lead to becoming very important. Uh, with those drawings, that became the backbone of how do I make these large figures to take up these uh, spaces in, in the museum wall. Uh, this is the first prototype that I built to talk to the structural engineer. This is the first successful prototype in the back where we started uh, trying to have a much more humanistic linear line quality to it. These are our friends Stephen Ann Bailey and some other friends uh, who actually uh, backed the project. You know, it gives you an opportunity to buy a forklift and do some other things, but uh, it's, it's it, truly enjoyable working on the larger projects. Uh, so, you know, from working in your own studio to working in Venice to starting making components. Um, we basically worked for uh, five years on this project. Um, so I started doing some works on paper that were the approximate scale. So this is uh, approximately nine feet by, I don't know, four feet, something like that. And this is one of our first mock-ups. We did a lot of classical early development, only can you, only if you pay your assistants can you get them to pose for you <laughs> to do things. And then we feel real lucky that uh, we have a friend who um, owns a uh, film company. And believe it or not, Knoxville is, I believe, about the fourth or fifth largest film producing uh, city in the country. Um, but with that said, uh, it, they produced a great documentary. The nice thing about working on this project in Knoxville is that we could have things in the studio take it to the museum, hold our scale. Uh, this is Emergence, the earlier couples. It actually does not go here in the museum. This is where Desire goes. And we ended up doing jigs, I think, some, uh, for a lot of things. This is the armature that we're working on for flight, which will armature the birds, which is the solution for the stairwell. Um, it was very much like boat making or cartoon making, making individual parts acquiring enough to uh, structure up. The larger, uh, which I, th this is one of the mo mo more exciting pieces to me in the whole project, uh, the, the scale of them and the poeticness of it is important. The, with these uh, figures, we do a traditional cartooning where we format out the pieces. And then once we get, uh, get it completely subsetted into the uh, sections that we think we can cast in glass, then we uh, trace them <coughs> with vellum. This vellum will then be transferred onto steel and uh, becomes the front skin. We now are cold bending these forms. At the time, I did not have that knowledge, uh, so I'd use sort of uh, preliminary uh, uh, techniques uh, like a wheelwright would use from centuries ago. In working on this project, what I really try to do is try to have sort of lateral knowledge to be able to achieve uh, imaging for, for the pieces. So here we are in the, in the studio, ladle casting, where our steel armature uh, is our mold as well as our um, final object. Here we are with the pizza of glass getting ready to go into the annealer. Here we are after we have cast out this figure. This is approximately 19 feet in length. And then the steel frame, which after it's been patinated, before it's stuffed, this is the uh, female equivalent with the uh, linear quality. When I was working on the project, I, I wanted a sense of place. So we started out with primordial, uh, which were the trees, emergence, which were the two uh, cartoons of the figures that you saw. Then we went to flight, which were the, the uh, armature of the uh, doves. And it also gives you an opportunity to, to use your intelligence. We were in um, 
This is the sky component. I'm trying to figure out the exact curvature. So I'm using a uh, technique that Gaudi used for figuring out his cathedrals. You put a weight on a string. Here we're trying to get more of a curvature instead of a arc and a point. But we're deciding on what the radius is. Um, I thought that this actually would make a fabulous pool cabana. But uh, <coughs> we, met, we basically use it as a, a sub-armature for the universe section of sky. So this is the back wall. Uh, the curvature of it um, to articulate the stutter of the stairwell, uh, I used the sky component of uh, the project to link the two sides. And so we based it on a half a circle. And this is a 30-foot radius arc that this curvature is based on. And with the front side and back side, this is a little bit flip floppy as far as how things work, but in, in, in a sense of actually working on the project, uh, we were working on, on a multiplicity of things at one time where we'd work on something for a little bit, go back and work on something else. And so really a number of projects were uh, worked on simultaneous. And if you actually um, are perceptive, you'll see that I've repeated some of these slides. <laughs> but it seemed like you were making them again and again and again, so. Um, And I think one of the things, one of the challenges that uh, occurred in uh, what I tried to do with the museum projects is, is one, is I did not want to in, impede on the floor space, and two, I felt that being realistic, I needed to have a install time of a maximum of three months. So we basically made the, the work at the studio. I had a wall, and then once we completed the uh, Adolescence, which is uh, primordial emergence flight, and then maturity, which is uh, desire tree of life contemplation. We would move them over to our annex and re reset them up because I wanted to be able to have them together and look and make sure that I didn't need to do any adjustments. But here we are with uh, documenting all our components. I believe there are 130 some odd units of the birds in flight. Uh, this is sort of work that's evolved from this with a different color palette and the Tree of Life uh, components with uh, steel armatures. So we assembled, assembled them about two or three times by the time we finally installed them at the museum. Individual uh, graphite molds. This is the one uh, icon that goes down to the floor. This is the uh, tree trunk for the uh, Tree of Life section. Here we are working on the steel frame of contemplation and getting ready to cast it. It's the largest figure. To be able to get it into the museum, we broke it into two parts. The uh, technical problem that we had working on the um, installation is that it was a trazo floor, and uh, if we have uh, the largest component being uh, a ton and the forklift being uh, 7,000 pounds, uh, what is the stress load that we do not want to tra uh, crack our terrazzo floor? So there was a lot, you know, because it would have been very much easier if it was outside and you just hook a crane on it and swing it into place. We actually did crane the large pieces in. This is the finished object that uh, from the original uh, prototype to talk with the structural engineer. It's approximately eight feet in size. And again, going back to cartooning and contemplation, if you look at the line down the nose, that actually... Uh, <clears throat> bisects the piece. Again, the layout of our steel armature with the one side and then the second side. Here we are uh, preparing. You can, if you look closely, you can see the line drawings that James has already transferred uh, with a uh, pen, which we plasma cut. And basically, uh, instead of having a drawing with glass, it's a, a steel drawing with a, a glass uh, backing. And it is industrial because it does have to support the weight. Um, when we were developing the project going down to the museum, I feel extremely lucky. Uh, I thought there were, to have enough depth, I would probably have about a th uh, th three foot shelf. And uh, I pointed at the uh, wall above the door and said, I think we'll put it one foot above the door. If I'd have read the blueprints, I could have not picked a more perfect place. Um, I hit within a, a quarter to three-eighths of an inch of the bottom span of the 26-inch I-beam that supported the other museum. So that is what we used as a basic um, 
form. Uh, using uh, the concept of a cantilevered barn, I developed a pole and beam system which would support the weight. So you basically are concerned with supporting weight and worrying about peel. And peel means that it falls off the wall um, from the top down, not the straight down. These are works, I wanted to have the luminous quality in the sky, so instead of starting with small prototyping and going to larger figures, I did bodies of work that were larger figures, which actually ended up being prototyping for all my small uh, constellation orbs for the material. Originally, this was go the project was going to be black and white, and uh, when I got to the sky component, I sort of uh, threw that rule out and uh, changed to color where I felt it would be more effective. So there are two basic parts of sky, sort of this constellation part of sky uh, and a metaphysical part of sky. If you see all these taped, uh, I'm sorry, backwards. If you see all these taped sections, this is our uh, demarcation. Each of these specifically go in one specific spot and so they're, um, they're hung by wires, so hopefully it seems suspended and effortless. Uh, with this project, uh, I never knew how many meetings you actually would have. I will say that we had uh, some dear friends that did watch after us. We have a friend who actually originally built the museum. He had a fabulous support staff um, in the uh, retrofitting. The, the museum started as, as this project and they did, ended up doing a, a $10 million retrofit upgrade to the museum uh, during this project. So it sort of uh, expanded into a life of its own. Here we are with this post and beam uh, uh, structure coming out of the wall. Because of the scale of the work and the interest in egress, uh, we had to crane the major components over the wall. Here we are starting to uh, assemble the universe section of sky. We designed this so it um, is on pivoting ball joints, so if there are earthquakes, it just will wiggle up there and not snap the uh, well, well joints. So as we started to, uh, as I tore down the uh, old acoustic tiles, and started putting in the new ones, I had had my head up a little bit further to the right, and I thought I had three-foot clearance in the uh, uh, ceiling. And as I tore out the old acoustic tiles, the majority of the places where these uh, cords are armatured, as you can see one that sort of bisects James' face, um, were in the HVAC ductwork, so we had to redo the ductwork for the Great Hall before we could install that, those components. Here we are uh, moving the uh, heaviest piece of the, the project up into place, which ended up being sort of the final piece of installation, and then installing the uh, components for the Tree of Life section. Originally, we were gonna try to do it like a book because of uh, other construction uh, uh, work that impeded on our, our workspace. We ended up doing it a little bit more randomly. Here we are uh, putting the trees, which sort of, which will cap out to the ceiling. Also, as we finished the project, we wanted to have it be uh, received with interest. Um, we uh, got a local uh, tent manufacturer to do a curtain for us. I think when we started doing the curtain, uh, or the veil, as I like to say, everybody went, Oh, it's going to look like a shower curtain. Well, how can there be a shower curtain that's 105 feet long by 22 to start with? But uh, this, was met, this veil was made in about six sections, which hook and, and Velcro up. And it's this uh, fabulous uh, material that uh, this is a military uh, contract tent maker. They basically use it as an interior sub facing for uh, something like a uh, Polar Tech interior for insulated uh, tents. But uh, I use it as a, uh, a drawing surface. The interesting thing is, uh, archivally, nothing sticks to it. It wicks, uh, wicks water. Uh, but uh, we got it, some paint to work on it for uh, this purpose, anyway. This is the uh, refurb Knoxville Museum of Art. It's uh, Tennessee pink marble. They uh, freeze-dried, uh, which used to be sandblasting, but they use dry ice to freeze-dry the surface and, and get the dirt off, do the acquisition. This is uh, museum director David Butler. This is the center icon of uh, 
the universe section of sky. So left to right, it's uh, primordial emergence flight. And then uh, desire, tree of life, contemplation. And then the metaphysical parts of sky and then the universe parts of sky. And it becomes magical at night. The shadowing, I think, uh, gives it much more of a, a, a celestial uh, feel. And this is the uh, night view from the exterior. So if you want to have cocktails at the Holiday Inn in Knoxville, Tennessee, or stay there, ask for the west side of the building. <laughs> I'd like to close with this... Um, Image. I, I think as an artist, you have to have a fierce belief in yourself. Um, this is a uh, sarcophagus from uh, Postum, and I don't know the exact analogy uh, between death and, and life and water that uh, the Greeks truly believe, but you just have to be fearless and be willing to dive into whatever the next project is. Thank you for coming.